So we left off talking about um, how different organic compounds are digested in the small intestine. Um, before we finish that, this was one thing that I um, forgot to add to the stomach portion. Um, we didn't get into exactly how um, the hydrochloric acid is secreted into the stomach and we don't need to worry about the the details of it um, for the most part. It's uh, definitely, you know, like a level above what we're covering. But the one thing that I did want to add is that in order to put acid into the stomach, um, the body is actually um, creating it. And um, typically when we create acids, we're also creating bases. So the trade-off for secreting hydrochloric acid is that um, bicarbonate is a byproduct and it ends up in the blood. Um, now this isn't a big deal. Um, our body has a lot of acid-base balancing mechanisms that you'll learn about in the second semester. But there is a brief amount of time where the blood coming out of the digestive system is a bit alkaline. And so we actually call it the alkaline tide um, because it's consistently associated with meals since that's when we have an increase in hydrochloric acid secretion into the stomach. So just the, just the basics of that because it's sort of a, um, a predictable phenomenon that we know happens and it'll doesn't always get brought up when you actually do cover um, pH balance in the body. So just wanted to um, mention that and give you a nice little slide on it. Okay, so we talked about um, breaking down proteins into amino acids um, with a couple of different levels of enzymes and uh, then we stopped at lipids because um, it's, it's a little bit more than just breaking them down. So lipids uh, have a slightly more complicated digestive process than the proteins and the carbohydrates do, and that's because they're hydrophobic. So both proteins and carbohydrates are hydrophilic. They dissolve um, into solution in water, and so it's easy for enzymes to gain access to them because they're all in solution. But as hydrophobic substances, lipids are um, not really accessible in solution. They're suspended in there, but they tend to glob together. And so the enzymes, being proteins, can't readily gain access to these lipids to break them down for absorption. So we need more than just enzymes in order to digest lipids. And that's where the bile comes in. So the whole reason why we have bile and bile salts is a process called lipid emulsification. So emulsifica bleh, emulsification is where we take a large fat globule and we break it down into a bunch of smaller globules. And those smaller globules are then accessible to the enzymes um, and can break down these triglycerides for absorption. Uh, emulsification is the same process that soap uses um, to, you know, clean greases uh, and oils off of whatever we need soap for. So when you're washing your cooking dishes, you know, and you have to clean the, the oils and fats off of whatever you were cooking, when we're washing our hands and the rest of our bodies and we're specifically trying to get oil broken up, um, cleaned off, uh, when you're washing your clothes and you're using detergent, all of those things are emulsifying lipids. So we do the same process in our small intestine thanks to the bile salts. And in that, after the bile salts emulsify the droplets, then those lipases from the pancreas and other um, enzymes in the small intestine are able to break down these triglycerides. So the triglycerides are broken down into fatty acids and monoglycerides. So basically triglycerides are a glycerol, this little guy here, and then these three fatty acids. And instead of separating that glycerol, we keep that together 
So we have a bunch of fatty acids. And again, because they're hydrophobic, it's not as simple as just absorbing them through protein channels, which is, we'll talk about this in a second, um, how the carbohydrates and amino acids are absorbed. Um, instead, we're going to package them. So the bile salts and especially the phospholipids play a critical role in getting the um, fatty acids, uh, cholesterols, and monoglycerides through um, the enterocytes. So we create what are called micelles, which are kind of similar to the way that the plasma membrane works. So on the outside, we have all of this um, polar hydrophilic stuff that is able to interact with water. And on the inside, we have all the hydrophobic stuff that is not able to interact with water, protected away from it. So then when we want to absorb things, um, we're talking about moving things from the lumen of the small intestine primarily, because the small intestine absorbs almost everything that we consume. So basically, any digestible components of the food, um, about 80% of the electrolytes we consume, and then about 90% of the water. Um, and um, we'll go through this in, in a little bit more, but when we talk about the water, we're not just talking about what we drink, we're also talking about all of these secretions that have been added to the food that we eat in order to help digest it. So the majority of the water that gets absorbed in our intestines is actually secreted from our stomach, our pancreas, and our small intestine. Um, the water that we're drinking is a relatively small component of how much water we're able to absorb. So there's five different options for how things can be absorbed, and they're basically the options for how things can move across membranes. So these are not new concepts, but now we're just looking at them in a slightly different way. So we can, of course, use active transport and um, pump things in. Um, certain things are, of course, going to be able to move through by simple diffusion. A lot of things are going to move either by facilitated diffusion, so through a protein channel, or by secondary active transport, where they're moving um, with something else because of an active transport process. And then anything that's larger is gonna have to move by endocytosis. So that means that the membrane of the enterocyte is actually gonna have to engulf a particle and bring it in. So uh, the vast majority of things, as I said, are moving by either um, facilitated diffusion or by secondary active transport. The primary active transport that drives the secondary is going to be sodium pumps. And the way that it works is that, so the, the lumen is up here, and so all the food and stuff that we've been digesting is up here, okay? But the cells, the enterocytes, they pump sodium out from the other side. So they're pumping it out into the extracellular fluid along the basal aspect of the cell. And that sets up a sodium gradient. So we have very low sodium in the cell and we do have high sodium on the other side. And so then sodium is going to flow from the lumen down its concentration gradient into the cell and that is constantly maintained by pumping it out. And so various other things are able to follow the sodium in co-transport, co co-channels by this uh, secondary active diffusion. Um, a lot of amino acids do this and both glucose and galactose, so two out of three of the monosaccharides are going to be able to enter in that fashion. Um, the lipids uh, are kind of a weird thing, so they basically just diffuse in because they have the same qualities as the plasma membrane, so they just kind of, you know, hey guys, we're going to just move on through. Um, it's, it's kind of a weird combination of diffusion and um, endocytosis, to be honest. 
Um, and we're going to talk about this more um, on the metabolism side, but once the micelles go into the cell, they actually have to get processed and repackaged. And then they are um, ejected as uh, different bundles of lipids and they get absorbed into the lacteals. So the lacteals are the lymphatic capillaries. Um, and this is worth pointing out because absolutely everything else that gets absorbed through enterocytes is ab absorbed directly into the blood. So lipids are the only thing that don't go straight into the blood at the level of the small intestine. So we'll cover the detail of that more um, in a little bit in the next lecture that we're doing later today. Um, but this is a picture of what that looks like. So this is mesentery, um, the peritoneal covering that suspends small intestine. So there's small intestine over here, and then the mesentery is here. Um, you can see some blood vessels. And then these white guys, these white guys are lymphatic vessels. So they're not carrying blood, they're carrying um, overflow, overflow fluid that the blood system is kind of not reabsorbing. Um, and in the intestines, they're often white because they've absorbed all the li lipids in a meal. So when they're white like that, they're much more easily visible. Um, usually we don't see them very readily because um, there's nothing pigmenting these vessels. Um, of course, we do digest things beyond proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. So I mentioned that we have enzymes to break down nucleic acids. So we do digest any DNA and RNA in our meals. And basically, anytime we eat foods that aren't processed, so when we're eating like whole plants and stuff, um, you know, if you can still identify it as a carrot or broccoli or something, it's going to have intact cells. And as long as it has intact cells, it has DNA and RNA in it. So we do digest all of that. It is actively transported into the enterocytes as um, basically as like uh, monomers. Um, this, is, this is why, by the way, this is a total tangent and we don't have time for it, but um, if any of you go shopping and you've noticed the whole like labeling of GMO stuff, genetically modified produce, um, it makes no sense because um, s s some people's arguments for why that matters is because, well, there's, they've changed the DNA. There's DNA in our food and um, there's DNA in all, all of our food, guys, and we actually digest it, so it doesn't matter. Um, we're going to digest it just as well regardless of where the genes originally came from. So. Total tangent, not something we have time for, but trust me, it doesn't matter. Um, and then vitamins and minerals are um, the other uh, categories of nutrients. And um, the way we absorb those does vary based on the specifics. Um, for the most part, um, vitamins um, are absorbed by either transporters for the water-soluble vitamins or they're transported with the lipids. So there's a couple that are lipid soluble. Um, that's vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin, oh, well, we're not really absorbing, yeah, a little bit of K, and um, E. And then everybody else, so C and all the B vitamins get these transporters. B12, of course, requires the binding of that intrinsic factor from the stomach. Um, with the minerals, for the most part, um, they're following sodium. So uh, most of the minerals that we're absorbing are what we usually think about as electrolytes. So for the most part, we're talking about potassium and chloride and a couple of other guys. Uh, for the, some of the other minerals, there are some exceptions. Should be on the next slide. Yeah, there it is. Um, so the vast majority of minerals, if they're in there, they're absorbed. And then we just kind of deal with them. Um, because calcium and iron have such important roles in the body and their amounts are very heavily regulated, um, we can actually control how much of it we absorb based on current need. So we've talked about the calcium side of that a little bit. Um, so we'll just look at it again real quick from this point of view. 
um, and I'll briefly go through the iron absorption controls as well. Um, and that's, of course, because if we absorb too much, there's going to be consequences, right? We can't have our calcium levels getting too high in our blood. Um, we'll accidentally mineralize things that we're not supposed to, or we'll, you know, disrupt electrical activity in various areas, because as we've talked about a little bit, um, you know, calcium has a role in, like, neuron firing, right? So, um, with the iron absorption, um, iron is also heavily regulated, and that's because um, iron ions can be highly disruptive. So they can cause issues if they're allowed to just be somewhere. And for that reason, iron in our bodies is always attached to some sort of protein. So we have a variety of transport proteins and storage proteins whose job it is to escort iron wherever it goes. And iron, of course, has very important roles in the body because at a minimum, it's in every single red blood cell attached to every single oxygen that we carry. So simply for the purposes of oxygen transport, iron is crucial, um, but we can't have it just doing whatever it wants. So um, it's tightly controlled. Um, up to and including the charge that the iron ions are even allowed to be in when they're absorbed and transported and stuff. Um, and we're not going to worry about the specifics, of course, because that's so far beyond what we cover, but just so that you're aware that this is something that's tightly controlled, including how much of it we absorb. Um, but we typically absorb however much we need in order to maintain um, our iron stores, which we do store some of it. Um, especially in the liver and, of course, our active iron in things like our red blood cells and then our muscle tissue um, as myoglobin. Um, with the calcium, we have talked about this um, in bones. Um, so remember, though, that for calcium absorption in the uh, digestive system, vitamin D is the critical factor. So parathyroid hormone is the one regulating blood levels and um, increasing them if they get too low. But in order to actually absorb calcium from the lumen of the intestines, we need the vitamin D. And that's because the vitamin D is going to affect how many channels we have to actually bring the calcium in. Um, again, because we need to control that. And again, we don't need to know the details of it. Um, but just being aware that this is something that is controlled. Um, and, you know, since sometimes we worry about our calcium levels or even our iron levels, a lot of people do struggle with anemia. Um, I put some links down for those guys if that's something that you are curious about or you have a particular interest in. But this is the level that we're going to know it at. Um, so for water, um, water can both freely cross um, the membranes to a certain extent, um, but for the most part, it's following sodium. So the active transport of the solutes is gonna drive water to move by osmosis. So we don't typically have to work very hard to absorb our water. All we have to do is make sure we're absorbing enough of the sodium and the water will follow. It'll follow everything else too, but it's mostly the sodium. So the small intestine is receiving about nine liters of water a day. Like I said, most of the water going through and getting absorbed isn't what we're consuming, it's what's also being secreted in to the tract for aiding in digestion. Um, so most of it gets reabsorbed in the small intestine. The remaining proportion gets absorbed in the large intestine, as we'll touch on in a little bit. Um, so we're typically only losing a few hundred milliliters um, to the feces, which is of course going to be necessary to let it be moist enough to um, pass. We do not want to be passing rock hard feces. It's very uncomfortable. Um, this is how much we can typically absorb per hour. Um, you do not need to know these numbers. Um, but just to give you an idea of, again, you don't need to know the numbers, but just to give you an idea of the trends. 
So on average, we drink about two liters of water a day. I don't know where they got that number from, but it sounds about right. Um, and um, if you look at secretions, we're going to swallow about a liter and a half of saliva. We get a liter and a half of gastric secretions. That already takes us to 500 mils of water going through the stomach, plus a liter of bile, a liter of pancreatic juice, two liters of intestinal secretions. Um, so that's kind of how we get up to this, you know, 900 mils or, you know, whatever we're looking at. Um, so then most of it gets reabsorbed here. Um, a little bit of it is left to then get reabsorbed in the large intestine, and then we lose that little bit. Um, this is why things that disrupt your GI tract and cause diarrhea can rapidly dehydrate you, because if things are moving too fast through here, or if your enterocytes aren't able to absorb as much as normal, we start losing fairly large amounts of water in the feces. So that's kind of why maintaining hydration, um, if you have some sort of vomiting or diarrhea that's chronic is uh, really important. All right, so getting between the small intestine and the large intestine um, is going to require passage through um, a sphincter. So we have um, this sphincter between the large, uh, small intestine and the large intestine, it's called the ileocecal, ileocecal valve because it's specifically between the ileum and the cecum. So this is the end of the small intestine and the beginning of the large intestine. And what determines the flow between those two things is several reflexes that um, control how relaxed that sphincter is. So the gastroileal reflex is um, one of those long reflexes. So it's, you know, it's not just local. It goes up to like the intest, uh, not the intestines, the uh, central nervous system and stuff. And um, this one is triggered by stomach activity. So basically what happens is you eat a meal and it's going to move the last meal out of the small intestine and into the large intestine. So basically, you're getting increased uh, small intestinal activity in the ileum um, and relaxation of this sphincter to move that last meal out because now the next meal is coming down the line and we need to be ready for it. This is going to be enhanced by the hormone gastrin, which gets released by the stomach when it's stimulated. Um, and that's going to um, increase both of those things. So increase the motility in the ileum, increase relaxation. Um, and although this doesn't directly drive the whole thing where eating will often lead to pooping, especially if you're like a baby or something, this is part of it. Every time you eat a meal, everything else that's already in there gets advanced further down the line. So the large intestine, um, doesn't have to do very much compared to the small intestine. Basically, its job is to absorb the rest of the water out of what was basically indigestible because ideally you absorbed everything useful out of what you already ate. Um, so really you're just getting some remaining electrolytes and the remaining water, and then you're getting rid of the rest. Um, we do gain some nutritional benefits from the large intestine, though, because we have a large amount of bacteria in there that are supposed to be there, and they get to metabolize whatever we couldn't digest. For the most part, that's going to be fiber, so indigestible carbohydrates, and when they do that, they will generate um, various uh, metabolic products, some of which are beneficial to us. So um, this is how we get, for example, certain uh, vitamins because they actually make them for us and then we can absorb them. Um, and there are some um, energy related products that are called uh, volatile fatty acids that we actually do absorb um, that are good for the health of our large intestine. 
So um, fiber, you know, not being able to digest everything in our diet is, is actually a good thing. We do want some stuff going through here. Um, we wanna keep our bacteria fed and happy. Um, now, the reason that the large intestine is large and the small intestine is small isn't to do with length. I always forget that, so I put it in. It's to do with diameter. So the small intestine is a small diameter, but is very, very, very long. And the large intestine is a fairly long, uh, large diameter, but it's relatively short. Okay, so we name them for the di diameters, not for their lengths. Uh, the large intestine has four major regions to it. So remember, small intestine had three. Um, the, um, this part has four. So the cecum is the beginning part. Um, it's kind of like a little sac. Um, and this is where the appendix is. It's on the blind end of it. So basically, the ileum comes in. There's a little valve. And the cecum sits like this. And then the appendix is like right here. Uh, so stuff moves in and then it proceeds on to the colon, which is the majority of the length of the large intestine. So we have several different sections to it. If you started looking at your stuff in lab, um, then you saw that it goes ascending um, and then transverse goes across from uh, right to left and then descending and then it goes sigmoid. Um, and then we have names for the various turns that connect those portions. And then we end in the rectum. So the rectum is just the last eight inches or so of the large intestine. Um, it contains three rectal folds. So we also call them valves. So they're basically like little in foldings of the mucosa and submucosa. Not that dissimilar from the rugae. Um, their job is literally to make sure that we can pass gas without accidentally pooping. It's important to be able to do that. Um, and then, of course, we end the large intestine and the uh, GI tract with the anus. So there's a canal, and then there's the two sphincters. There's the smooth muscle internal sphincter, and then a skeletal muscle external sphincter. So it all kind of looks like this. Um, basically, our large intestine frames our small intestine. I don't know why it goes like this, but it does. And it's pretty consistent between species, so clearly this layout worked well. Um, so, little appendix here. Um, the cecum is just the very first portion. It's not very large. Um, the ileum is here. And then we go towards the head in our ascending colon. This is the flexure. It has a couple different names, uh, right colic or hepatic, because the liver's right here. That takes us to transverse, because it's literally going across the abdomen. Um, this is the left colic or splenic flexure because your spleen is right here. And then we descend to the sigmoid. Sigmoid literally means S-shaped, which if you look sideways, it is. And then basically the part that goes straight out is the rectum. Remember, rectum just means straight. It's the straight exity part uh, to the anus. So um, just like we had some features to the small intestine, we have features to the large intestine too. Um, so the small intestine had things to increase its uh, surface area. Um, the large intestine has features to um, basically enhance the way that it needs to have motility. So um, the longitudinal smooth muscle of the large intestine is actually clustered into three bands. Instead of being uniformly distributed, it's, it's in three stripes basically along the length. So we call these the te uh, teniae. Tenia coli, um, tenia, I don't know off the top of my head right now. I used to know, we could look these things up. Um, so yeah, they're kind of like this. Um, and the, uh, the results of that um, is that because these guys are always gonna have some amount of tone, some amount of muscle tension, um, that the large intestine kind of pouches in between. So the pouches are called haustra, and it's just the um, it's just the, the the shape of it. Um, and then the third feature, and this is the one we don't actually understand the purpose of, um, is on the outside. So epiploic appendages are basically just um, extra fat um, inside the visceral peritoneum of the large intestine 
that are attached to the tenia. Tenia. It's tenia. I gotta look that up. Um, we don't know why those are there, but we know that they are quite consistently. So it kind of looks like this. These different colored bands running here, these are the tenia. And then you can see the haustra are this classic um, corrugated appearance. And then the epiploic appendages are little fatty globules that just hang off of the tenia. So those are the specific features of the colon. That's how we can recognize which one's which when we're looking at it. Um, you know, no, don't, well, sorry, the cat advanced the slide. Um, when we're looking at it, yeah, just in general. Um, and so then here's kind of rectum and anus. So she's showing you those folds slash valves. So they just kind of partially occlude the lumen. And um, then um, something that you can look at in lab is, so this, uh, this little line they're showing here, this is where we transition from um, the mucous membrane of the intestinal tract to uh, basically skin. So we go from here, it's gonna be um, stratified squamous, keratinized. And I do believe I gave you a slide of that to look at too. Uh, the external sphincter sits outside. It's made up of various muscles of the pelvic floor. And then of course the inner one is just thickening of the smooth muscle layers of, um, of the tract. So there are um, various features inside of the anus, but the important one is that there are mucus glands. So there's a lot of mucus production here because we wanna make sure everything is well lubricated on the way out. Um, and this, this one's nice because it shows you how the epithelium transitions. For some reason, they call the line where we start getting squamous the dentate line, which is just weird. So when we look at the large intestine under a microscope, um, it can be confusing. It can kind of look like the small intestine, but the difference is that whereas the large intestine has the villi that project out and then also has those crypts, the large intestine just has the crypts. So it's kind of like a standard surface. It doesn't look fuzzy if you looked at it from the inside and then there's gonna be just little holes. So a little bit more like the stomach. Um, instead of making enzymes and stuff, we're just making a lot of mucus. So goblet cells for mucus production and enterocytes primarily for water and salt absorption. So the mucus is of course lubricating the passage of feces um, this is still going to be a columnar epithelium, but we're not, um, no brush border anymore. So there shouldn't be a microvilli because we just don't need that much. And then, um, as I mentioned at the anus, we switch over to stratified squamous epithelium because, um, it's in contact with the external world. And the columns and the sinuses are the uh, luminal texture to the anus. Um, so when we look at it, it's much simpler here um, because we just have a couple different cell types. Well, I guess we do still have microvilli. Oh yeah. Um, so it looks like this, all the little lighter spots are goblet cells for mucus. Um, we have a large immune presence here too, so we'll have um, lymph lymphatic tissue in the submucosa or in the lamina propria, sorry. So it should look something like this. Uh, so the difference here is that the small intestine would still have finger-like projections up. It can be hard to tell because it's all very crowded in there and when we cut sections it can it can all kind of look the same. Um, but comparing them to each other directly is usually the best way to get a feel for how to tell one from the other. Um, so a little more, 
damn it. Sorry, cats. So um, yeah, so then this is just a slightly prettier picture of that mucosa. And then this one is showing you how the longitudinal muscle is banded instead of completely distributed um, around the whole thing like it is everywhere else. Uh, a little bit more about these bacteria. So um, microbiome is the term that we use for um, all of the bacterial species that live in our, mostly our large intestine. Um, we know that there are thousands of species and that there are probably other microbes that aren't bacteria as well. Um, we still don't know what they all are, uh, in part because they don't necessarily grow well in a lab, and in part because the easiest way to sample what's in there is to um, test feces, and that's not always a representative sample of what's actually inside, because that's just a, a representative sample of what's made it out, and that's not always the same thing. Um, so this is a growing field of study, because now we're getting better at identifying bacteria just by testing DNA instead of having to grow them. So we're slowly getting a better feel for what's in there, but we still don't know a lot about it. What we do know, though, is that what they do is fermentation. So this is going to be a low oxygen environment, and they are fermenting um, mostly the fiber that we can't digest, so indigestible carbohydrates. Although anything that passes through the small intestine, if we miss protein, if we miss um, carbohydrates like simple sugars, they will digest that too. Sometimes um, we don't enjoy that part. Um, and then they produce those volatile fatty acids and also a lot of gas. So um, gas production is normal in the large intestine and it is because of the bacteria and uh, we just kind of pass it and move on with our lives. Um, and of course your book mentions this, so the proper term for uh, intestinal gas is flatus and so then flatulence is when you're passing it. If you want to know the real terms for it. And then the vitamins, as I said, that are actually made are the um, a couple of the B vitamins and then vitamin K is uh, the big one. So we do tend to get some vitamin K in our diet, but um, it's of limited importance as long as we have a fully functional large intestine. Um, this is just the best thing I could find for a microbiome. Um, this is going to have increasing importance the more we understand of it. Um, we're learning more and more about how the bacteria influence the digestive system and the links between the digestive system and other parts of the body, especially because of the enteric nervous system and the fact that the bacteria seem to interact. We're really not like just single multicellular life forms. We seem to just be colonies for a bunch of microorganisms. So very interesting, don't have time to go into it. Um, so the physiology of this stuff, um, it usually takes about 12 to 24 hours to process a meal. So to absorb the water, vitamins, and electrolytes from the end of a meal. Um, and then of course the last function is to eliminate whatever doesn't get absorbed. So the types of motility that we see in the large intestine, um, household contractions are the segmentation type mixing things um, that we see where we're kind of sloshing the contents of the different haustra. And that just helps keep, um, keep things moving for water absorption and stuff. And then it, when we need to actually um, clear the large intestine, then we have mass movements. So mass movements are typically triggered again by filling in the stomach. So we had a gastroileal reflex. We also have a gastrocolic reflex. So the gastrocolic reflex is where we have these, you know, waves of peristalsis that move through the large intestine and they force large intestinal contents into the sigmoid colon and the rectum. And forcing them in there is what triggers uh, the defecation reflex. So this is literally the reflex whereby when we eat, we should then have to poop. 
Now, a variety of factors influence why that doesn't happen every single time we eat, but it's pretty consistent when you're like a baby. We even see this in other species. So if you have a puppy or if you have had one at any time, you know that you should feed them and then 20 minutes later you should take them out to potty because otherwise they will have an accident in the house. So the defecation reflex is the last thing that we do, right? So it's the final function of the digestive system. It's the only one that the anus gets credit for. Um, what we call feces is literally everything that didn't get absorbed or digested. Um, so anything undigestible in the food, anything unabsorbed out of that content, um, a surprisingly large number of bacteria make up our feces. So like, it's mostly bacteria, really. It's kind of gross. Um, also, epithelial cells that have been shed from the large intestine, and of course, mucus and whatever remaining water and salt are in there. So defecation is similar to um, deglutition, to swallowing, and that is a combination of involuntary and voluntary um, actions. So the mass movements trigger the involuntary portion, so literally stretching the rectal mucosa by shoving contents into there is going to trigger a parasympathetic reflex at the level of the spinal cord. And what it triggers is contraction of that sigmoid colon and rectum. So basically it's like, oh, oh, we got stuff. We better get rid of it. Let's squeeze it the rest of the way out. Your internal anal sphincter relaxes. Now... <laughs> Obviously, it's not always a good time to poop. So you actually have an a involuntary contraction of the external anal sphincter. So that's what leads to the whole awareness of the fact that you need to defecate, but not actually immediately defecating. Yay for that. Um, and that's when you find out about it, and then you have a choice to make. Is it a good time to poop? Can we go poop? No? okay, then no. And so basically, if you say, all right, it's a good time, you go put yourself in the right place, you relax your external anal sphincter, and you poop. If it's not a good time, you constrict it. Now, what happens when you constrict it is that it takes a little bit longer, and then your smooth muscle does that thing where it's like, all right, okay, we've been stretched for a while, we're going to relax again. And then that urge goes away, and it tends to stay that way until we have another round of mass movements. Um, they're not always linked to eating, so they tend to happen every couple of hours regardless. Um, and uh, at that point, you'll get the same question. Um, a very similar thing happens when you have to urinate, actually. So um, hard to find a good diagram of this. So even though this is essentially a useless diagram, here is a diagram showing you all the different parts of the large intestine that get signals um, when you have to poop. So when you actually, when you say, yeah, it's a good time, let's do this. So you typically throw more than just relaxing the anal sphincter into the voluntary effort. So we can aid the smooth muscle contractions with skeletal muscle effort. Um, the skeletal muscles that we use for this are actually the abdominal muscles. So, you know, rectus abdominis, the obliques, that kind of stuff. Um, in order to use those, we have to do something that they have called the Valsalva maneuver because some guy named Valsalva um, came up with it for a completely different function. And if you want to look it up, look it up. Um, basically, the original Valsalva is when you like do the thing where you like hold your breath and you plug your nose and you exhale and it makes your ears pop which I have never done before, and I am terrified to try. I'm not trying it. Don't do it, um, unless you are directed to by a doctor, please. But the, so we call it that, but what we do, this is called bearing down. I should have written that down. Bearing down. So bearing down is when you hold your breath by closing your glottis. So your glottis is, is the, the beginning of your trachea. So you can, you don't realize it, but like, you know, when you like, and the reason why you're not breathing out is because you've actually closed the top of your airway. So by closing the top of your airway, when you use your abdominal muscles, instead of them making you breathe out, instead it increases your intra-abdominal pressure. 
and that's going to aid in a various thing. So we do this when we want to voluntarily assist in urination as well as defecation. And this is also essentially the same thing that happens when you are pushing during childbirth. So these are just different ways that we can um, voluntarily help these reflexive actions. Um, you can also do this to the point of passing out. So that's why I say don't just do it. Um, and it is possible for people to pass out while pooping if they try too hard. So um, one of the reasons is that um, when you're doing that, you are enhancing the parasympathetic feedback. And parasympathetic tone, of course, does things like decrease your blood pressure, decrease your heart rate. Um, and so vasovagal uh, syncope is passing out because your vagus nerve made your blood vessels too uh, relaxed. Um, so yeah, and people have been known to like have heart attacks and stuff using that Valsalva maneuver. So that's why I say don't just start doing it for fun, um, maybe read up on it first. I don't know how much science exists um, in this squatty potty thing, but um, the goal is that you're, uh, excuse me, appropriately aligning your rectum, something like that. But they make really funny commercials, so. Um, okay, so we have a nice overview slide on all of that, and now we're gonna move on to metabolism, which obviously my timing is now horrible and I guess I will finish it up um, with a catch up lecture tomorrow or something. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, but we'll at least get started. Give me one second. All right, so metabolism. So we're kind of just gonna work our way through what the body does with these nutrients after they get absorbed. That's kind of what we're going for here. Um, and I'm guessing that about here is where I will run out of time. And so I'll hit up. Okay, metabolism. Sorry about that. Apparently my internet just crapped out. Let's try this again. Okay, so um, remember metabolism is biochemical reactions in the body and we split them into two categories. So catabolic or catabolism is where we're breaking down complex molecules and releasing energy. So generally the goal of this is production of ATP. Um, anabolism is where we build complex molecules and store energy. So the goal of this is in a really small nutshell that oversimplifies it completely, um, but we're making polymers, right? So we're making proteins, we're making glycogen, we're making triglycerides, whatever. Um, so remember, we, we talked about this at the very beginning. Now, um, these processes are regulated by a variety of factors, but the major factor that drives this stuff is hormones a bunch of different hormones that are working to maintain homeostasis. Typically, by the time we get to the digestive system, you've covered the endocrine system because that's like the normal order of things. 
we have not done that. So we're not going to get into the hormonal control very much, but I just want to introduce you to the major players. So um, the most important catabolic hormones, so the most important ones that stimulate our body to break down molecules to make ATP are cortisol, glucagon, and epinephrine. And epinephrine, at least, we've talked about a little bit. So cortisol is um, produced in the adrenal gland, in the adrenal cortex. It's actually where it gets its name from. Um, and it's released in response to stress. It's a complete oversimplification, but it's fine. And also an oversimplification, it stimulates gluconeogenesis. So the formation of new glucose in the liver, mostly, from other molecules. And we'll talk a little bit more about gluconeogenesis in a bit. Glucagon is released in response to low blood sugar. This is from the endocrine part of the pancreas. And uh, basically, it tells the liver to release glucose to keep our blood sugar levels up. So it makes the liver break down glycogen, and then it also stimulates gluconeogenesis. So, so far, catabolic hormones make us keep our blood sugar levels up. So epinephrine, as you know, is released by the adrenal medulla um, in response to acute stress. So whatever is going to trigger the sympathetic nervous system is typically going to um, uh, cause the release of epinephrine. Not only does it stimulate gluconeogenesis, but of course it also increases heart rate, um, increases the strength of the heart beating, increases our blood pressure, and it opens our airways so that we are bringing in more oxygen. So the gluconeogenesis here is, or the, the increased glucose levels, um, are in order to fuel those processes. Um, the cortisol release is also to fuel whatever accommodations we have to make to respond to whatever stress triggered the release of the cortisol. And then the glucagon is really just about, oh, your blood sugar got too low. And we'll address that, um, that part a little bit more um, at the end of the lecture. So then the anabolic hormones um, are all about using energy to make things. And these are the major players here. Um, growth hormone, um, that's not insulin-like growth, oh boy. Well, I got it right on the next slide. Um, insulin-like growth factor, insulin, testosterone, and estrogen are kind of our major anabolic hormones. They're not the only ones, but they're the big players. So growth hormone is released from the pituitary gland and it stimulates the growth of cells and tissues in a nutshell. Um, interestingly, it also stimulates gluconeogenesis in the liver. So it's not a strictly anabolic hormone, but it does that so that the body has fuel to do the other thing. So it's definitely more anabolic than catabolic. Now, one of the things that it does is stimulate the release of insulin-like growth factor, which actually is a more direct stimulant of the growth of muscles and bone. So insulin-like growth factor is actually more of an anabolic growth hormone than growth hormone itself. You'll learn about that more later. We don't need to worry about it any more than that. Um, that's for the endocrine system. And then insulin is, of course, the opposite of glucagon. So it's released when blood sugar is too high and it makes your body take the, the glucose out of the blood. So it promotes uptake of glucose by body tissues to use. It promotes the storage of glucose in muscle and liver as glycogen. And it promotes um, glucose conversion into triglycerides into, in the adipose. So we've got plenty of glucose, take it out of the blood, use it as you will everybody gets glucose. It's kind of how insulin works. And again, from the pancreas. Um, testosterone and estrogen are sex hormones, so they're released from um, the testes and the ovaries. It's not as straightforward as this um, because we actually, both, both uh, genders make testosterone and estrogen, and 
the gonads aren't the only place, but it, it doesn't matter. Um, either way, they are anabolic. So testosterone especially um, kind of fits our classic idea of an anabolic hormone in that it um, stimulates bone and muscle growth. So bone, especially for strength, and muscle, both strength and muscle mass. So literally bulks you up. Um, estrogen um, will have a little bit of that effect, but mostly it just increases metabolism and it increases fat deposition in specific areas because it is of course um, responsible for, you know, um, like secondary sex characteristics of females. And you'll learn way more about how these two hormones work when you get to um, the, uh, the reproductive system. But for now, we're just considering them as some major anabolic hormones. And um, the other big factor when we talk about um, metabolism is looking into more detail at the catabolic processes. So what happens when we're driving cells towards catabolism? Well, the major thing is that, of course, we're making ATP, and we're going to do that by a process called cellular respiration. So cellular respiration is defined as a group of catabolic reactions that use fuel from food to regenerate ATP. And the major way that we regenerate ATP ultimately is called phosphorylation. So adding a high energy phosphate group to a molecule. So we take an ADP and we add a phosphate using cellular respiration and we get an ATP because ATP isn't just made from scratch. For the most part, it is just recycled and regenerated. And then, of course, ATP goes on to do all of the things that we need to do work in the cell. So there's two types of phosphorylation that can be used in cellular respiration to make ATP. Um, substrate level phosphorylation is the direct transfer of a phosphate group from an already phosphorylated substance. So we've seen some of this before because we talked about uh, creatine phosphate and how we can transfer that phosphate group to make quick ATP in skeletal muscle. That's an example of substrate level phosphorylation. Um, we'll learn about another one today. And then oxidative phosphorylation is when we use an extensive process of chemiosmosis. So basically, we're using a concentration gradient. Specifically, we're going to move hydrogen ions, which we'll, we'll talk about how that works. And then we use um, an enzyme to power the process of physically attaching phosphates to ADPs. Um, this one is far more efficient, and we get a lot more ATP out of it. So we'll see how that works as we go through this. All right, so we're going to go through the steps of cellular respiration and, um, yep, see how that works. Um, we can do that by following carbohydrate metabolism because glucose is our ideal molecule for running through cellular respiration. So all dietary carbohydrates get converted into glucose for catabolic purposes. So we can only absorb those monosaccharides. We can only absorb glucose, fructose, and galactose. But both fructose and galactose essentially have to get converted into glucose in order to run through this. Um, in order to get glucose into cells, we use facilitated diffusion. Um, we can also use secondary active transport. Um, but GLETs are just glucose transporters. And they thought that would make a good abbreviation. Kind of works. Um, so uh, some cells control the amount of glucose transporters that they have, um, mostly under the influence of insulin, and other cells always have them. Once glucose gets into cells, cells want to make sure they keep them. So they drive their concentration gradient by actually using energy to phosphorylate the glucose. So in order to get ATP, you have to use ATP. It's like the whole spending money to make money thing, which in this case is true. Sometimes it's not true. 
Um, and so the reason why we do this is because if glucose is moving passively down its concentration gradient and we're not ready to use it right away, um, there's going to be a limit to how much glucose we can get into the cell. But if we keep taking away glucose by changing it into another molecule, then we'll be able to keep letting glucose flow down its concentration gradient into the cell so that the cell gets as much as it needs. So that's always our first step. We're basically trapping the glucose in the cell. And then we can get into cellular respiration, which is actually three different processes. So we break it down into three stages, and each of these stages is um, a whole chain of enzymatic reactions. So the first one's glycolysis. Second one has a bunch of names, uh, Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, or tricarboxylic acid cycle, which is where it gets its abbreviation of TCA cycle. And then the last step is the electron transport chain or the actual oxidative phosphorylation step. So this is kind of our summary slide for this. Um, I'm not gonna go through it right now, but this is really as much as we're gonna end up needing to know. So when you um, go back and study this, this is kind of our level of detail here. The interesting thing is that for as extensive as these three things are, and as many steps as they are, the entire thing can be summarized like this. We take a glucose, we add oxygens to it, we get a bunch of energy out in the forms of both ATP and heat, because there's always um, some amount of energy lost and it's in heat. This is good though, it, it helps us maintain our body temperature. Um, and we get six carbon dioxides and six waters. So the carbon dioxides are the six carbons from the glucose, and then the oxygens get combined with hydrogens to make water. So that's, that's everything we're about to talk about in like so many more steps than that. So the first part of this is glycolysis. Glycolysis occurs in the cytosol, so every cell can do this because every cell has a cytosol. Um, it takes 10 steps to take one glucose into two pyruvic acids. Um, it costs those two ATPs, so one of which we already talked about, trapping the glucose in the cell, but we get four ATPs out of it as well as two energy transfer molecules called NADHs. So this gains us only two ATPs total. And this is our substrate level phosphorylation. It's highly inefficient. Um, but it is an anaerobic process. So we don't need oxygen to do it. We don't need mitochondria to do it. And we do end up with these pyruvic acids, which can either go on to the next step, so to that TCA or Krebs cycle, or, and we see this in skeletal muscle, they can be converted into lactate. So when we're doing anaerobic metabolism, and this is the crazy summary of this, um, glycolysis, fate of pyruvate. Again, you don't need to know all the details here. Um, so we see this in skeletal muscle. We take a glucose, we get two ATPs total out of it, um, and we can't do anything with the pyruvate because the oxygen levels and the mitochondria, they haven't warmed up yet. So the skeletal muscle needs to get that pyruvate out so it can keep running glucose through this glycolysis process. So it converts it into this lactate, and that allows it to get it out of the cell and to continue running this glycolysis process and keep getting fast ATP out of the glucose. Okay, so this is a nice summary slide because it actually shows you what's happening and it doesn't have a ton of extra information on it. Okay, this is a good one to uh, look at again. So we have gone here. We're going to go here next and uh, we'll talk about what happens to this later. Um, I also do have this so that I don't forget to talk about it later. The lactates do go into the blood, and most of the time they get picked up by the liver, although the heart can do this too. And they take that lactate and they can either turn it back into glucose or they can turn it back into pyruvate and run it through the same 
rest of the cycle that we're about to talk about. Okay, so they call this the Cori cycle, which is liver providing glucose for muscle, muscle turning it into lactate, lactate going back to the liver to get converted back and back and back. Because the liver is awesome, you guys. Okay, so if we do have oxygen and we are ready to use this pyruvate and keep processing it, um, we have to get it into the mitochondria. So to get into the Krebs or TCA cycle, we have to go through this quick transitional phase. So the goal is to get into the mitochondria because the mitochondria is where the rest of the process takes place. So the first thing that happens is a decarboxylation process. Decarboxylation just means we take a carbon dioxide off. And so this is actually the first carbon dioxide that is produced in the process of cellular respiration. So we've got our waste product. The carbon dioxide produced in this entire process is why we breathe out carbon dioxide. Okay, that's why I emphasize that. Um, we also have to get that uh, energy transfer molecule NADH into the mitochondria. So it has to get um, reduced and the pyruvic acid gets converted into a molecule called acetyl-CoA. It's a two carbon molecule attached to this CO um, enzyme that's converted from vitamin B5. You don't need to know that part, okay? Um, basically, it's just made into the appropriate format to go into the TCA cycle. Okay, so we're in the mitochondria. We have moved the pyruvic acids and converted them into acetyl-CoA, and that's the form they need to enter this cycle. Now it's called a cycle because we're literally gonna be cycling things around. Um, so the acetyl-CoA goes in, it runs through a series of reactions, none of which you need to know. We knock, two more carbon dioxides off of the molecule, which essentially means that we've processed that acetyl-CoA. Um, we make more electron transfer things, and uh, we, we yield one ATP. Woo, one ATP out of the whole thing, guys. It's great. Um, so that's a little bit of substrate level phosphorylation there. Um, now the point of this is basically just to process these carbons and get the energy off of them. And we do that by um, making these other compounds. So you don't need to know what these are or anything like that, but they are just kind of like energy transport compounds. Um, we're calling them reduced coenzymes here. So that takes care of um, most of our carbon dioxide production. So we've technically actually processed our glucose. Glucose has now been processed, but we haven't gotten very much ATP. And that's because we haven't gone through the last step, which is the oxidative phosphorylation. So getting a lot of ATP phosphorylated by using the electron transport chain. Now the electron transport chain requires oxygen and takes place in the mitochondria. And it's literally the reason why we need oxygen. This is why we breathe, okay? Cellular respiration is why we breathe oxygen in and it's why we breathe carbon dioxide out. So the electron transport chain is a series of enzymatic complexes that pass electrons down the line to give them to oxygen. And in the meantime, they use this process to maintain a hydrogen gradient across the mitochondrial membrane. So we've got these enzymes and they are just kind of passing these electrons down and they're using the energy of the, of the electrons to pump hydrogen ions across the inner mitochondrial membrane. So we have a lot of hydrogen over here and we have very little hydrogen over here because we're maintaining a pump, okay? 
um, the electrons ultimately get passed to oxygen and we make uh, water out of it. Um, without oxygen, this whole thing stops because we need the oxygen at the end to like catch these electrons. In order to actually make ATP, we have a single place where the hydrogen ions are able to move down their concentration gradient. Um, and that is through this protein channel called ATP synthase. So ATP synthase uses the concentration gradient of hydrogen to power phosphorylating ATPs. It's literally a turbine, like it's actually shaped like this. It actually moves its little rotor around as the hydrogens go through. Like we have this teeny tiny molecular machine in all of our mitochondria and that's going to lead to the creation of ATP. So basically we can always do glycolysis because it doesn't need oxygen and it doesn't need mitochondria. But if we want to get a decent amount of ATP out of our glucose, we have to run it through the Krebs cycle to finish processing the glucose. And that's where we get a bunch of carbon dioxide from. And then we have to run it through the um, electron transport chain to actually get a bunch of ATP out of it and make water. So these two mitochondrial processes only work together. They both do separate parts of the same process. Um, um, yep, yeah. so, and that's how we make most of our ATP because we have a pretty high yield. We get over 30 ATP um, in this process and um, it's, uh, it's reasonably efficient for um, a life-related process. Okay, so that's cellular respiration, like in a, in a nutshell. The opposite process is the gluconeogenesis that I mentioned before. So gluconeogenesis literally just means new formation of glucose um, is anabolic, and it's how we take other organic molecules and make glucose out of them. So we can use pyruvate and lactate from that process. So I kind of like I showed you in the liver, the liver can reverse glycolysis basically. We can also use glycerol, which is the three carbon chain of triglycerides. And then a couple of amino acids can be made into glucose as well. Most gluconeogenesis does occur in the liver, as well as a lot of glycogenolysis, so the breakdown of glycogen to release stored glucose, um, because the liver is the major organ that maintains our blood sugar levels by making, um, making glucose and releasing it into the blood. So, little summary there. Um, most, um, most parts of the body can't do this. So this ability to re basically reverse glycolysis, run it in reverse, um, is going to take you back to that glucose 6-phosphate. So the, the glucose that's phosphorylated to keep it in the cell. Most cells can't reverse the process back to glucose, and so therefore most cells can't release glucose. The liver and the kidneys are basically the only ones that do it. The liver is the primary organ to do this. The kidneys will help out when um, the liver can't keep up, basically. Okay, so that's, that's gluconeogenesis is basically reversing glycolysis. And ultimately that is glucose metabolism as well because um, carbohydrates all get brought down to that. So um, when we look at the metabolism of our other organic molecules of lipids and of proteins, 
we're kind of looking at how we can fit them into the cellular respiration process and still get ATP out of them? And if not, how else can we use them to get energy um, or to, uh, you know, or to create the, the, the storage forms of these guys? What time is it? How are we doing? Yeah, we're totally done. Cool. So um, uh, tomorrow, um, I need to check my schedule. I'll send an announcement probably in the afternoon. Um, I guess I'll finish this up because we're out of time and um, I need to tackle those lab questions uh, before we go. Okay, um, hold on. Stop this.